Welcome to the ATA Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Baird, and you're listening to Inside Specialization, our series on the what, why, and how of specializing in a specific field of translation or interpreting. In each episode, members of ATA's Professional Development Committee will interview translation and interpreting specialists. They'll ask about what the work entails, what skills are needed, the pros and cons, and so much more. The goal is to showcase the variety of career paths in translation and interpreting and help working professionals and students understand what's out there, how they can get started, and what they need to succeed. Specialization is arguably the best way to strengthen your translation and interpreting business and stand out from the crowd. We're hoping to bring you one episode a month, and we hope you'll join us on this informative journey. This podcast is brought to you by the American Translators Association. If you'd like to know more about ATA, we'll have some information at the end of the show. All right, now over to the PD Committee and this edition of Inside Specialization. Hello, and welcome to the latest edition of the ATA Podcast Specialization Series, a special collaboration between the ATA Podcast and ATA Professional Development Committee. My name is Andy Benzo, and I'm a member of ATA Professional Development Committee. We're excited to bring you this episode where we'll hear about cosmetics translation from someone who has worked with L'Oreal, Chanel, and Stale Order, among other companies. I am very pleased to introduce Bernice Font, who joins us from Querétaro, Mexico. Bernice is a multicultural trans creator, localizer, marketing translator, and certified editor with international life experience. As the daughter of a Mexican ambassador, she has traveled the world since her birth in Cairo and resided in seven different countries. Brazil, Italy, Spain, France, India, Colombia, and Mexico. She took an extensive part in diplomatic life, acquiring a unique multicultural background and meeting diverse personalities like writers, artists, celebrities, Nobel Prix, and literature prizes winners, and also the most enriching anonymous people from around the world. She is passionate about art, literature, culture, and psychology. And she also writes a blog on travel and psychology called Caminos Andados. Hi, Berenice. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much for inviting me and having me here, Andy. It's our pleasure. So, first question, can you tell us about your background and how you found your way to the beauty and cosmetic sector, which is so interesting? <laughs> of course. Well, I started translating I, um, when at my first official job uh, at a Brazilian software company. That was 16 years ago. And I had not studied anything related to translation. However, I, I was already... Uh, fluent in six languages, and my uh, my boss at the time, he was a real leader, he saw the potential and asked me to start translating then. So to be honest, my background in translation is purely from experience. I started working in-house at this software company, then I left the company and I started working as a freelancer. And uh, when I finally found myself in the translation market, I realized I really needed to take a decision on what I was going to work, what, what I was going to work on. Right. So it was either technical, legal, uh, audiovisual or something more creative or literature. And because of I have I love reading. I have worked. I worked in a literary agency when I was in college in Barcelona, and most of my life was always oriented towards culture and arts. I thought, well, I need to find something creative. I am not really drawn into legal or technical, so I started. Uh, I started working more. Uh, I, f I found out that there was something called trans creation. And so I said, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to learn. This is where I want to work. And so I started working and marketing myself as a creative translator. And uh, the way, I, the, the, the way uh, I found my way to the, 
beauty and cosmetic sector, uh, working with some translation agencies that were specialized, that their main clients were these big, big companies. Because, and we will talk, I, I'm sure we will talk a little bit more about it uh, in, in our interview. The truth is um, to work with companies like L'Oreal or Stelloder, it's normally through an agency. They hardly ever work directly with, uh, with freelancers. So uh, this is not something I purposely chose. I didn't think, okay, I want to work in the cosmetic fields, but they started sending me this work and of course I loved it. And so that helped me to learn, to gain experience and to keep marketing myself as specialized in cosmetics. That's awesome, thank you. And uh, well, we know that your path is not typical. So um, what can somebody who's interested in the beauty and cosmetic translation start? I think I would say the same. I, I would say a person that is looking to work in this field should be already working in the marketing and advertising industry. It, um, there should be a creative translator with a, a little bit of knowledge of transcreation, uh, of course, a little bit of knowledge of copywriting, and uh, they should look for agencies that work in this field so they can start gaining experiences experience in this in this particular field of translation super interesting why copywriting well as you know trans transcreation is a mix between translation and copywriting uh copywriting allows for more freedom of course you know it's like you you start writing the copy from scratch and uh, what's very important about copywriting is that your writing is focused towards being persuasive and, of course, getting the reader or the consumer to do something you want to do. Either subscribe to a newsletter, uh, buy a membership, or buy the product, right? So it's good to know a little bit of copywriting because if you mix it with your translation skills, then it becomes transcreation. And that's what you need for, of course, for cosmetics, uh, the main, the main things we translate are advertising and marketing materials. Of course, we also translate the product descriptions and the ingredients. All of that is important, but all of that is always, um, the, the objective is, is always to sell. So you need to be able to do a translation that is persuasive. Yes. So what do you like the most and what did you dislike the most, if anything, about translating for such prominent brands? Well, of course, the main thing I loved was that I kept learning. The, the cosmetics and beauty sector is very alive. There are trends coming in all the time, uh, marketing trends and also life, lifestyle trends. Like, for example, I was, I've, been, I've been working on, on this course that I'm going to design on, on cosmetic translation and I have been investigating on the new trends that there are. And they, they keep they keep coming in, you know. Some are maybe they, they come in for only a, a little while, and some become like a big trend. Like for example, right now the biggest trend in the cosmetics is that people are interested not only make, you know if you buy makeup, and even, I, I realize that even I do that, you know. If I buy if I buy makeup, I don't want it only to be an aesthetic for an aesthetic. Uh, objective. I also want it to be for wellness. For example, if I put on some cream in the morning in my face, uh, this cream is also not only for moisturizing, but it also has some sunscreen in it and it also has a little bit of color. So it, it, has, it, it has become a mix between, okay, I want this to make me look pretty, but I also want it to make me feel good be healthy. So what I really liked, for example, one of my main and first jobs in the cosmetics was to translate L'Oreal's blog articles. So it was amazing because I learned so many things. And that, that's really my favorite thing. I get to learn, I get to stay um, uh, updated on everything that is happening. And there's really nothing that I dislike Really, I mean, everything is most, uh, mostly something really cool. I love it. And so how do you keep learning? Do, how do you, anybody can do that? Tell us how do you do to keep learning, what you do? 
Well, first thing, of course, experience to keep working. You know, keep working. Keep keep. As you, as we all know, translation. We learn about the stuff we are translating. So that's that's the main thing. Second thing is, uh, for example, I read. Um, I am subscribed, and I read the newsletters of the main companies, like of course L'Oreal and all of that. Um, I read blogs. Uh, social media is really important. It's really important to follow all these brands so that you stay on top. You know, like the, like, like I was saying, the trends, uh, the new products, uh, the way that the way these brands are marketing themselves. Uh, you need to, you know, you need to stay connected to know which are the new brands that are innovating. Um, so I would say you really need to stay active and reading and participating in the whole social movement. That's the main part. And an also part that helps me a lot is to follow my colleagues who are also specialized in cosmetics on LinkedIn, because some of them, they share like very, very good content that keeps me updated. It's very interesting. And also, of course, if I need them, their help, uh, sometimes if I don't find something, I can contact them. And that makes me keep that, that helps me to keep learning, of course. Right. We all do that in our specialization because, the, you know, we are not complete dictionary. So always a good friend or somebody who does the same you do. That's phenomenal. Uh, in your opinion, what is the outlook for translating beauty and cosmetics? Is this a growing field? Oh, absolutely. I've been I've been reading a lot about that. Um, I've been reading some reports on the industry and the the numbers are they're amazing let me look i was trying to have this here well it's like some multi-billion um uh, revenue every year and it's supposed to grow so much to until 20 uh, to 2027 and the thing is uh what's very important about this this industry is that of course, brands start locally, but in order to grow, they all go global, all of them. So to go global, they need us. They need translators. They need local localizers. So since the industry, the numbers uh, are really very, very positive on how much they will grow, I think we will keep having a lot of work in the field. So it's very, it's a very good, it's really a very good area of specialization. It's, it's cool, it's fun, and there's a lot of work, and it's going to keep coming. That is great news. Yes. So how do you, since you mentioned localization, how do you ensure cultural sensitivity when translating cosmetics? Well, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind, and we all know this as professional translators, is you really need to be native, and you, and it's very important. This is a this is a point that I always um, highlight when I'm pitching my services to new clients. I live in the target market, so I translate for Mexico, Latin America, and I also do some U.S. Spanish. And I know I, work, I, I travel a lot to, to the south of, of the U.S. and I know people who live there and I'm always trying to stay on top of that. Um, so it's very important, number one, to make sure that you're working with a native person that lives in the target market. Uh, that's very, very essential because if you live here, you know what's going on. You you are really updated on all the trends, and you have the you have the feeling right, the, the cultural feeling of what you can say, what you cannot say. Um, so this is number one. Then of course it's very important to avoid literal translation. Uh, it's very important to make sure you always keep an eye to cultural and social nuances on your copies. Um, for example, you have to make sure you know what's going on in the in the market. I remember this is not related to cosmetics, but this is an example that I always have loved. Um, I was I was working with another trans creator. We were trans creating an advertising campaign for an alcohol brand, and it was actually it was actually their website. 
and they were talking about the history of the brand where there were some uh, the, the images they were describing were the founders they they were using um it was something like they were you they, they they were protecting their land with some guns and there was a little bit of uh, nuances that were aiming towards violence in in a way and the the trans creator and i we advised the company this was back in 2010 or something like that and unfortunately in mexico we are experiencing a lot of violence and we said you know it's not a very good idea right now to talk about this why don't we use an example where we don't really talk about guns or uh, or machine guns like like they are using actually in the in the in the source copy why don't we make it a little bit smoother and in spanish we say defendieron a capa y espada su terreno that was like we, we we softened it a little bit. We still kept the idea that that the founders of the company they were strong and they were defending their land in in a, in a brave, courageous way. But we didn't use the images that 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 implied violence. So same thing here, you know, um, for for any kind of translation, but especially for any kind of trans creation and advertising, you need to be able to remember what is the social um, uh, what is the social surroundings you're living and make sure that that yeah that that you don't you don't talk about things that may people that that may take people to places we don't want to go and that will not help at at selling your product right um, so another thing would be also to consider you have to look at the pictures you have to look at the colors and make sure that all of that is uh, adapt adapted to the culture where you are to the also make sure that there are no references to religious or social values that are not valued where you are so all of this all of this is to guarantee this, the cultural sensitivity. And for that, really, I, I say it again, I'm going to repeat it again. It's important that the person translating is native and is living in a target market. Very good. Very good comments. And I'm learning a lot with you. I'm very, very happy to hear all this. Now, has artificial intelligence disrupted your area of work in any way? Well, in cosmetics and trans creation, not yet. Because, as you know, really, uh, it's um, a, a machine translation is very good nowadays, but it's still quite literal. And as we were, we just said that it's important to move away from the copy to make sure that we are uh, translating it in a persuasive way and also keeping the cultural sensitivity. So for now, AI or or machine translation is not used in in creative cosmetic translations. Very good. However, however, I think it can be beneficial for the technical part of the cosmetic translation, may, maybe to help you figure out if you're translating the terminology correctly or to help you find where are the sources of the, um, you know, there is a lot of, um, there is a lot of, of standards for how you can translate some terms uh the fda or some european um organisms you all of that you can look you can actually ask chat gtp can you please take me to a play, to one of the um um approved glossaries for this and this type of translations and it can help you in that way but mm, it's not disruptive it's just it, it's actually more productive and helpful. But that's only in your research part, not in the translation. Right. I agree with you 100%. I think that we can, we should use it as an, um, as a tool and not as a, the end of it, not as a medium, yeah. but a, not, as a, not a as a replacement. It's, I yes. think it's going to help us a lot in productivity if we know how to use it well. Yes. So can you share a specific example from a cosmetic project that challenged you and how you solved it? <laughs> I think that all, all the projects are challenging uh, in a way or another. I think the, 
The difficulty of the cosmetic translation is that it combines technical translation with creative translation. When I say technical, I mean there are so many, um, the terminology, the terminology sometimes can be very technical. Sometimes it's, it's, it's up to, to like um, chemicals, name, the names of the chemicals. Uh, or also, you, for example, let me give you an example. Moisturizing and hydrating is not the same thing, even though we could think that it is. But if you go a little bit deeper, you will see that um, hydrating mm, is about your skin being able to absorb the humidity from the air. And moisturizing, actually, you put on something that locks that creates like a film that locks in the moisture you already have and doesn't let it doesn't let the skin um, doesn't let the moisture get out of your skin so it's different it's like there's these nuances and you need to know a little bit about this so you need to have this knowledge which is technical so that so you can adapt your translations correctly this is one difficulty of cosmetic translations and the other one is that you really need to you really need to know more about creative translation, copywriting, so that your copy is persuasive. You need to have this balance between uh, I'm telling the reader, I'm explaining to the reader the, the technical part, but I am also making it sound appealing and I want to make sure the reader or, or the consumer will buy the product. So you have to you have to combine this, both these skills to have a, a good a good quality cosmetics translation. So this is, a, I think this is the most the, the dif most difficult part of this, but it's doable, of course, and we can use we can use all our research skills to make sure we know, for example, this the, the difference between moisturizing and hydrating, and then all our knowledge and uh, all our knowledge and our skills in copywriting and translation, we combine it all, and that's it. <laughs> well, thank you. I didn't know the difference. I thought most of and Hedrin were the same. So very good that I learned that. <laughs> and um, I, you know, we all know our specialty um, field. So this is, I'm learning so much. I love it. Uh, do you have a favorite project that you work that's in your mind that, oh, that was really my love well project? I think like I think what I mentioned earlier, my favorite project really was uh, translating the the L'Oreal's blog because it was so. Uh, it, first of all, it was constant work. They kept they kept coming up with articles all the time, and it was very different. Sometimes they would talk about skin, then they would talk about um, makeup, then hair, and then. Uh, uh, solar, you know, um, sunscreen, all kinds of things. And because really cosmetics is much more than just makeup or, or, or moisturizing creams. It, it, it can go to even, uh, it, it can go to holistic health. It can go, like I said, well-being. It can go to even pets. Uh, how to groom their hair or or even sexual well-being it's it's very 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 big so you learn a lot and that's what I really liked about L'Oreal's blog I, I I I kept doing different things it kept challenging me to to discover more I wish I was still working in that <laughs> well thank you so much Bernice for your time and ladies letting us learn more about your specialization. It was really super interesting and entertaining, and I'm going to look more into cosmetics because I realize I don't know anything about it. And I'm sure that our listeners will find your advice and insights very helpful and inspiring. Thank you so much, Andy, for having me today. You've been listening to Inside Specialization, our series on the what, why, and how of specializing in a specific field of translation or interpreting. Big thanks to everyone involved in the production of this episode. ATA's PD committee developed and coordinated the interview. Mixing and editing was done by Derek Platts. ATA headquarters provided editorial and technical support. Now, if you learned anything new in today's podcast, I bet there's somebody out there who would like to know it too. Don't be stingy. Tell them about us. I've gotten to know so many great podcasts that way. I promise they'll thank you for it. And if you're not an ATA member, listen up. I've been a member for over 20 years. I can honestly say that ATA launched my freelance career and I've never looked back. 
Nowadays, the demand for translators and interpreters is at an all-time high, but finding quality work isn't easy. ATA membership can make a difference. And ATA isn't just for translators or interpreters. Individuals, companies, and organizations can become members. We have teachers, professors, hospital administrators, language company owners, technology developers, as well as language companies, universities, hospitals, and government agencies. Go to ATA's website, atanet.org, for details. Or check out past episodes of this podcast where we talk about the benefits of membership and what's currently happening in the association. Thanks again for listening, everyone. Talk to you again soon.